Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ben Clark, I'm a developer at Meta, this is Brian Hussle, he's with Clark, and we are partners in crime trying to make, thank you, <laughs> trying to make Rabbit a little bit better. Um, so let's start with a show of hands, how many folks here use ID? Keep them up if you've used Rabbit. Okay, so uh, that's great. So we're here to talk about some data sets and also some new developments for a renderer. So do you want to do the, yeah, I'll do the, the right clicking thing? thing. Sure. So we're going to start off with a brief refresher on what Rapid is. We're going to talk a little bit about what we've been up to lately for data sets and a new announcement that is brand new, hot off the presses, future plans and Q&A. And also I will call out that all of the Meta team will be doing a Birds of a Feather session later this afternoon at 1.30. So if you have uh, in-depth technical questions or you want to talk about road conflation or daylight uh, or Eduardo's uh, uh, mapping session uh, that he did about uh, pedestrian, uh, features, you can come talk to us about those then. So, what is Rapid? It's basically ID with an extra sprinkling of data sets. Uh, on top, those data sets range from the macro AI data sets provided by Microsoft, Google, and Meta, to smaller, more county level data sets like what you get from our Esri integration. Um, so we have like individual counties and uh, individual townships provide authoritative data sets to us for things like buildings and address points, and soon, hopefully, also roads. So uh, we have a whole backend uh, service that serves all of this stuff up. We make calls uh, also out to Esri's uh, data set uh, service that they've made available to us, which is pretty cool. Um, so to give you an idea of what that looks like, here's what you would get with ID, which is just the OSM layer. Then we can add the Microsoft building footprints on top of that, and then finally, if you uh, use our Esri integration, you can also add uh, data set, another data set for addresses. And here's what the UI looks like uh, for the Esri integration in Rapid. If you have more questions about the Esri data lifecycle, there is a session that our uh, fellow partners in crime, uh, Steve and Dean, are putting on for Esri tomorrow. Uh, so be sure to check that out. I'm not going to say any more about it here because they're far better uh, equipped to handle those questions than I am. So, Lately, the Esri integration is up to about 137 data sets. Um, one of them is that massive Google Africa Buildings data set that was released last half of last year. Um, so that added about 50 million new buildings. Microsoft added about 50 million new buildings in Africa last year as well. So the data sets are growing, which means that we're constantly trying to add more and more stuff to the map. So that leads us to our next announcement, which is brand new for State of the Map. And that is a bit of a performance demo of something that Brian and I have been working on for the last uh, three months or so. If I can just work the mouse pointer. Cool. So this is the old ID renderer. And this is me clicking and trying to pan the map around in a very small amount of data out in an abandoned mining, mining town in Colorado. And you can see the frames per second suffers. So. What we've done is completely rewritten the rapid renderer in WebGL, and it flies. Um, this is a lot of work, and it's still in process. And now Brian's going to take you through exactly how we were able to do that. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the session, I'll talk about some of the challenges we endured. Cool. There we go. All right, hey, so uh, like the slide says, uh, Rapid is slow. Um, <laughs> we know that there are faster technologies that we can use uh, for rendering complex scenes in the web browser. Um, and we've wanted to do this for a while. So um, like last year, we started exploring the idea of replacing the renderer with something better. We looked into a bunch of WebGL frameworks, and we settled on something called Pixie.js. Um, Pixie is a popular framework that's really designed around doing 2D graphics um, and browser-based games. So it's sort of like a replacement for Flash or SVG. Um, and it's been a really like a joy to work with for us. Um, there we go. So let's first talk about the old renderer. This is the code that we replaced. Um, it used D3.js. D3 is a really powerful visualization engine, um, but it's really reliant on binding all your data to the DOM. Uh, this slide shows the sort of classic D3 example um, where you, know, you have some data, which is like a list of cities here, and your D3 code will turn it into an SVG document, which has like a bunch of rectangles, um, and then you get a chart at the bottom. Um, 
And D3 is also great about handling changes in your data. So that if you change the data in any way, then you get updated rectangles. And it's all very dynamic. And it's a really popular, powerful framework for visualization. Um, and oops, let me go back. And it works for maps, too. Um, so <laughs> like a lot of you know, uh, it's traditionally how Rapid and ID before it did all of its rendering. Uh, so you start with some data, like the nodes and ways that we get from the OSM API. Um, or maybe some GeoJSON that we get for, you know, with some building footprints. Um, and then your D3 code will create an SVG document. So here we get a bunch of paths, and then you see all this in the browser um, as a map. And uh, you can do things with this SVG in your app. You can style the building's magenta uh, you know, with CSS, or you can listen to events like when the user hovers over the buildings or clicks on them. But uh, things start to break down uh, when you push more and more data at it. Uh, because the browser can only do so much. Um, the DOM API, which is how a browser-based application updates the content that you see, is notoriously slow. So you generally do not want your web application touching the DOM if you can help it. Uh, because when your application changes the, the DOM, the browser needs to recalculate where everything is and how it should be styled. Um, so so we are. this is our new pipeline, right? We, are, we aren't going to do that anymore. This is what the, the new graphics pipeline looks like. Our familiar map data still flows into it. Uh, but now we are generating a Pixie scene graph in memory. Pixie then turns all of that into WebGL draw calls. And Pixie is very, very super good at doing this. Um, for example, it will actually batch together uh, really similar things. So if you have a lot of magenta buildings, um, it's not going to draw every single one of them. It's just kind of going to fill up a buffer of points and then tells WebGL, like, hey, like set the color magenta and just draw what's in the buffer. So uh, it's fast. Uh, then we get our map drawn onto a WebGL canvas instead of into that chunky SVG document. Um, and this is, this is the comparison, right? So the old renderer, um, you're probably used to this, right? As soon as you get a really complex scene uh, that has a lot of data in it, uh, the, the browser starts to drag. The new renderer does not have that problem. So even basic editing tasks like dragging points and lines, it's so much more responsive. Um, just for fun, because <laughs> I'm crazy, and to kind of demonstrate how much better the new rendering pipeline is, this is a kind of busy scene. Um, we're probably not actually going to edit like here, but somebody shared this in Slack a few weeks ago. So I looked it up, and it's somewhere near Miami, Florida. Uh, there's around 45,000 OSM features in this view. Obviously, it's a lot of points. Um, and when I say features, it's not just points, because you know, a building can have like four or more points around it. So it's, it's just a lot of data. Um, people are mapping all the buildings, all the sidewalks, all the parking spaces, all the trees, you know. And I mean, look, like OSM has grown up, and uh, some parts of the world are becoming really, really micromapped at a level of detail that was really unthinkable when ID launched almost 10 years ago. Um, and you know, with with Rapid, we're not just talking about OSM's data. You know, we want to layer more data on top of this. So we add on AI detected roads. Um, Microsoft's buildings, any of the data that we get through our partnership with Esri. Um, and then in addition to that, it's like whatever overlays people are going to want to see, like QA layers or Mapillary. Uh, it's just a whole lot of data. Um, so uh, that place on the previous slide, I ran uh, Chrome's profiler, uh, the developer tools. What you see here is called a flame chart. And it shows where old Rapid was spending its time. Uh, we can see that it was taking like 10 seconds for, per frame, which is kind of unusable. Like, we usually like things to be frames per second, not the other way around. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if you would go on here, you would think that, you know, the browser just crashed or something. Um, so most of that work is spent updating the DOM and cleaning up memory, uh, because those DOM elements get churned up a lot. So, you know, Chrome is really just fighting itself. Then there's that purple recalculate style up there. Is Chrome trying to run all those thousands and thousands of CSS rules against everything in our huge document? Um, so this is what it looks like um, with the new renderer. Uh, running the profiler on the new WebGL Rapid in that same location, we are now getting seven frames per second, which is you know not amazing, but you can actually scroll around and do things. Rapid is not frozen. Uh, and this is a really interesting flame chart for us, because there's a lot of space where the code is actually doing nothing. Um, we spend a few milliseconds of CPU time setting up the scene. And then at the bottom, the green shows that we're GPU limited, which is a thing that's never happened before. So previously, we had a pretty solid performance wall. Now we have you know, opportunities to improve. 
Um, just so in summary here, the new renderer represents a huge shift in how we think about data in Rapid. Um, before, where the data uh, and the DOM and the styling were kind of locked together, now that's no longer true. Uh, there's no SVG document, no CSS, and the drawing happens much quicker. Uh, so we are also have put a couple of improvements in now that we have this new renderer. <laughs> Uh, let's talk about those. We've got improved label placement. Um, we took a fresh look at how the labels get placed. Before they had to be exactly next to the pin, now we try placements around the pin. So this is really good in places, if you've got a lot of pins, they're kind of in a line. This kind of just shows you the before and after. Um, you know, we, we render more labels now, and so we'd love to see people mapping more of these POIs. Uh, we also looked at the line label placement. This is sort of a, kind of a funny slide, but um, the old, algorithm would just kind of pick a spot on the line and you'd either get a label or you wouldn't. Now we actually can test several locations on the line and decide where the labels will look the best. Um, and we can actually label things that are not OSM. Here we're just, this is kind of silly. We're labeling all the address points in this data that we get from Esri. <laughs> uh, this is a cool performance trick, what we do. Um, we, uh, when the building shapes get very small, we can replace them with just a rectangle. Um, in this animation, I had to turn them blue so that you can see which ones are getting swapped out with the blue. The blue ones are just rectangles. They're like little textures. Um, because Pixie can actually, actually draw a whole lot of textured rectangles almost for free, so it's a really good performance boost of, at low detail. We don't have to show the whole footprint. Um, speaking of low zooms, uh, the idea of low zoom is kind of relative. <laughs> The Mercator projection stretches everything out at the poles, so we are making more of our rendering decisions based on what we're calling effective zoom, which is like saying what the zoom would be if you were at the equator. Um, so as an actual example here, two buildings that are they're the same size, but they just look different. One is in Ghana, one is in Norway. Um, so it's always been kind of unfair that we cut out the editing uh, with that yet yeah, zoom 16, and we show that button that says like zoom in to edit. So we're not gonna do that anymore. Um, <laughs> we're kind of rethinking what it means to edit at different zooms, using this idea of an effective zoom to guide those decisions. Um, so you might still need to zoom in to see more detail or to work with features that are simplified or too small, but we wanna move away from this idea that editing can only happen at zoom 16. Um, and then I can turn it over to Ben to talk a little bit about the challenges that we faced. Sure, yeah. I like this idea. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things we actually ran into is that we have a lot of labels that we need to render, and as you pan around the world, uh, there's just an inexhaustible supply of them. So eventually, as you pan around, you just overwhelm the GPU. It's trying to re refer to too many textures. So you can actually, you oh, ahead. I need to click ahead. Thank yeah, you. There you go, there's your textures. <laughs> so you can see we've done some experimenting to try and like build a dynamic sprite sheet out of all these line labels as you pan around to both save like memory address space, so that's an unsolved all uh, problem as of yet. Uh, and also, as Brian kind of hinted at, we're rendering, or capable of rendering so much more that we're able to zoom out further, but that's not really an effective strategy. We can't just display literally everything on the map. Uh, even here, this is a, a section of Manhattan where we're displaying a lot of map points, and it's already getting unusable, and if we were to actually zoom out completely, I went past it a bit. If we zoom out completely, um, highlighted in red is the section we just showed. If we were to display all the map points there, then it would be completely obscured by map pins and you wouldn't actually be able to see any of the buildings or roads underneath it. So we have a lot of basically cartography problems to solve now where we have to decide what is appropriate to render at what zoom level. Uh, and that's gonna be a lot of work. Uh, and this is just after we turned the uh, labels uh, on and started testing them. Both of us, we went to Manhattan just to see how crazy that would be, and the answer was pretty crazy. Um, finally, we know WebGL is a new tech. Uh, it's not universally well supported on every single device, so we have a lot of QA that we need to do to try and make sure uh, that this actually works. And there's a bug, known bug in Safari, so if you pop this open on your Mac and use it, it might be unusable because of an issue with Safari 15.3 and 4. Um, we can talk more about that at the Birds of a Feather session. So finally, we have a lot of QA to do. Uh, we have a lot of new data sets coming up. We have some road data sets that are coming up on the roadmap, no pun intended. Um, and we just have a lot of work ahead of us. So we're looking forward to getting feedback from you, especially at today's uh, Birds of a Feather. Um, we have a URL for you to try and use. So you can pop this open. It should work on your devices. It should work on your laptops to just browse around the map 
and take a look and let us know if you think it's more performant. Let us know if it, if it works for you. There is even some interactivity. You should be able to add rapid features. You should be able to circularize polygons and all that kind of stuff. Uh, other things like multi-select are disabled. Um, and that's it. So we have another session uh, for graph-based road completion today at 3, and we've got our birds of a feather at 1.30.